Hello and welcome back to part two of Betting People with Ed Hawkins. Um, so in part one, we discussed a bit more of Ed's background. We're going to do the same in part two, but with a particular focus um, towards some of Ed's betting methods and memories. But firstly, um, I do want to ask you, can you remember the first time you won something on a bet? Yeah, I think it must have been when I was about four and Corbier won the, won the national. Um, I probably had, my dad had probably put 25p on for me or something like that. Um, because most, most nationals um, we'd go up to uh, watch as a family, because as I said, my dad was a racing correspondent for the Guardian. So we'd, we'd be at um, Aintree um, with my, my brother and my mum and, and we'd go and sit at um, Beecher's Brook. And that was in the day, William, when you could get really actually quite close um, to Beecher's um, as a spectator. You were right on the rails and you'd have to get there about nine o'clock in the morning to get a decent position. Um, so I remember Corbier uh, winning because also we went to, went to see him come home to Jenny Pittman's in, in Lambourne. Um, and that's a memory which, which sticks out. Um, so that must have been one of the first, first bets I ever had. And obviously we we'll always have a bet on the national. Uh, I remember losing on Dark Ivy in 1987. I think it's my dad tipped it in The Guardian. Um, and, and losing pro probably pretty much every year since then. So um, not a great record when it comes to the national, but um, great memories of going to watch it, and particularly at Beaches Brook, because obviously I was so so young and so small. Yeah. Um, and you'd be sitting on the grass by the rails, and you wouldn't be able to see anything. And then when the race started, you just hear the sound of the hooves getting slowly louder and louder and louder until suddenly there was this huge roar and these horses would all fly over the fence and be carnage and ferns flying everywhere and incredible um, experience and memory. And can I ask, um, what was the first time, or what was the first winning cricket bet you had? I can't remember the first winning cricket bet I had. Um, no, I couldn't remember that. But um, I mean, I can remember plenty of um, I can remember plenty of bad, bad, tough losers. I remember the Caribbean World Cup, where I'd um, sold sixes um, because I felt the spread firms had overestimated the um, the idea that the Caribbean grounds was was small, and um, I'd also factored in the fact that against the minnows, they wouldn't always, the, the big teams wouldn't always be batting first. So I felt the price was too high. You know, like a good shrewd punter that you're supposed to be, the price is always too high. So you always, you always go low. And I did, uh, I did a lot of money on, on that one. But um, my earliest cricket, but I, I can't, I couldn't possibly remember. Um, and you're known as a cricket expert now i think it's fair to say that's how most people would know um you here but when did you when did it really begin to pay for you was there ever a sort of a eureka moment where you thought this is the route for me um cricket in or, or basically sort of punting on and trading cricket I think um early on when i was at the post um and i was there i think from about 2000, 2001, I think, started there. Um, I realised that I had a, I suppose I had an eye for a player. Um, I knew what a good player looked like just with, with my eye, the way he batted or the way he bowled. And, and I was able to um, make money off the back of that on sort of top bat markets or top bowler markets. And also just like, lining up 11 versus 11 and and seeing which players were, were, which teams were being overrated or underrated. Um, and also very early on learning that um, bookmakers would shorten up teams artificially because they just had players who people had heard of. And, and that, I think, is still the case now. Um, so those are the kind of first inklings that um, I felt I could do something with it. And... 
so throughout those racing post years, I was I was basically a I suppose I was a, most of the time I was an eye punter. I was backing on uh, teams or players who I'd seen um, a lot of and felt they were being underrated. Um, and then lastly, I moved into stats. Um, the, the statistical side of things has been quite difficult in cricket, and I'm sure we'll come to this in, in more detail later. That you know, in 2000, 2001, the ability to be able to go and look up um, all manner of weird and wonderful statistics just wasn't there. So you didn't really have much option but to be an iron player. I mean, obviously, you'd be able to find out toss bias and things like that and, and historic scorecards so you could work out likely first innings runs but um today you can you can really do a deep dive on on the data and come up with lots of uh, ways to to make cricket pay i think and that's probably one of the main changes i've um, seen in my sort of betting strategy um i'm not an eye punter anymore i'm not really backing people um because of what i've seen them do um it has to be statistics based now would you say um, that there was a sort of point, a sort of crossover period where you suddenly saw access to this data, which you believe gave you that sort of edge? Or was it sort of a more gradual process where, you know, one season, um, you know, you were going basically on, mostly on eye stuff and the next season suddenly say you had quick info um, or you had, you know, deeper databases that you could go and look at for instance, strike, yeah. um, top bat, top wicket or something like that? Yeah, um, I think the big change for me was social media because mm. I, I just didn't feel comfortable with saying this guy is going to be top bat um, off the basis of, you know, what I'd seen him do mm. um, because I, I always felt there was some there was somebody out there who could come up with a, you know, statistics which would blow that opinion completely out of the water and make you look a fool. Um, so that's one of the, that's the main reason why I thought, well, I've got to try and be not bomb proof on it, but I've got to really know, um, this guy's record, how often, um, he top scores, what is his average, not include, including not outs, you know, what does he do on a, a certain ground? And I used to do top bats or top bowlers on, um, on I, as I said, and then, and then I moved to, um, what I what, what I called in my sort of weird um, loser way, <laughs> like the Holy Trinity. Does mm. he have ground form? Is he in form? And does he have ground? Does he have form against the opposition? And I felt if those three things were on for a player, then that would be my edge on, on a top bat or top bowler. Um, and uh, you know, it's still it, it it was profitable, but that social media um, shift where you had experts coming up, up under, um, crawling out of rocks, underneath rocks and being able to access all this incredible data to prove you wrong um, made me change my approach. And I think you've seen that, really seen that in football with things like expected goals and the wealth of data that is available on, on football now. Um, and you can't just you can't have a lazy opinion on football anymore mm. um, because you'll be torn to shreds on Twitter or on other, or on other social media platforms. Others are available. So, you know, I felt I had to really try to get on top of that um, for cricket and be better with my data and understand more um, just because I didn't want to be letting people down. I wanted to be really on on top of it and across it and i'm not saying by the way you know you know i'm some sort of data god far from it there are people out there who are doing amazing things like dan weston um, on twitter give him a follow if you want to um know a bit more about how to build a, a t20 team um you know the data that these people have got all those crick viz and there's crick, crick viz analysis um which is an amazing resource as well um, Stats Guru has always been great, and there are other sites that you can find, mm. particularly on T20, which will really help you out to 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 get you that edge. Um, uh, and there is an edge, I think, because I think I think bookies are a little bit 
slow to catch up. I think, um, you know, in the future, we're going to see, be seeing people actually run statistical models. If they're not doing it already, I'm sure they are. I've seen a couple of people doing it on what is going to happen mm. um, on, on matches. And, F- such um, as be... Yeah, I mean, uh, Crick Viz do um, expected first innings runs in tests and um, in T20. And that was something I was quite keen to look at uh, on the podcast, the Cricket Only Better podcast for betting.betfair, because there is a little bit of noise with cricket punters that it's 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 just not reliable at all. Um, so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be saying just go away and bet what cricket is saying. Mm. Um, we've got to actually work out what they're saying is is accurate. But they have great data on things like how a batsman scores um, against a particular bowler. Um, which is a godsend for a top batsman wager. And it goes back to my earlier point. If I see Glenn Maxwell and I think, oh, this guy's a player, I think he's due for a top top bat effort, and I'm going to bet him to top score in a, in a 2020 match in the Big Bash. Um, someone could turn up some data from Crickviz and say, well, actually, Glenn Maxwell has got mm. a terrible record against these three bowlers in in this match you've tipped him. Why have you tipped him? And then, then what do you do? You're the expert here, because because that that's confounded me a bit. I was also thinking about another question I wanted to ask you, but go on. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it's um, it just kind of blows your edge out of the water. Your edge doesn't mm. really exist. Um, there is, you know, there's probably a point where the data actually eats itself, and you can probably find um, a statistic which will um, pin down a bit on most things, but. I just felt there was a real shift you know, five or six years ago that um, I needed to do, I needed to really uh, bore down on statistics and data to do, uh, to do more because I didn't want to be, be having lazy opinions um, and be exposed like that. So I'd say I'd, I'd, I'd bet in a completely different way to how I started now. And that's because mm. of social media, that's because of the internet and the wealth of information which is available um and i'll probably be betting in a different way if i'm still doing it in another 20 years <clears throat> so i think you've got to complete i've got i think you've got to evolve as a, as a hunter as a tipster uh, and that would go for any uh, sport you can't just be stuck in your ways you've got to be willing to learn um, and i'm always learning I, I wouldn't say that oh i've got this thing nailed what or uh, you know, I, I know the game at the back of my hand because I don't, because you've got to keep uh, pushing yourself and, and questioning things if you're going to keep doing well. Just on that note about progression, um, would you say that cricket is a better traded sport now than it was when you started out? Yeah, because of mainly because of the, um, the wealth of formats that are available now. Well, we've got Test Cricket, ODI Cricket, T20... We've got T10, we're going to have the 100 next summer. Um, and 2020 is incredible for trading and, and in-play betting. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, um, it's a vastly changed sport um, to bet on. Mm. When I was at the Post, the biggest day of the year was the county cricket preview, uh, when the county cricket season was starting. I think we used to do, that, do about four or five pages on that. Um, I bet you. I bet you they don't do four or five pages now. Um, and if, if someone had told me that, you know, I'd be betting on the Pakistan Super League or um, Indian Premier League or uh, the St Lucia T10, which was which was a, a lockdown saviour, I just thought, well, that is crazy. I mean, it's completely exploded. It's a, it's a truly global game now because of because of T20. And the stuff you need to know um, is, is now you need to have a real uh, world view of, of cricket instead of the parochial view of county cricket. And that goes back to what I was saying about betting in a completely different way. Mm. County cricket was a was a was a big um, was a big area um, to bet on because bookmakers didn't have the time or inclination, or there certainly wasn't the money wagered on it for them to to put all that much time or resources into it. So there was always an edge on county cricket. Um, but now county cricket is, is, is irrelevant, really. 
we don't cover it on betting.betfair because the interest isn't there. We're more interested in the big bash, IPL. You know, we're not really interested in the T20 blast either. And just on <coughs> a sort of one last note, um, all of those changes you've described, do you think in the long run it's given cricket betters of all stripes more opportunity or do you think there are sort of sometimes more pitfalls in the sense that um it can be easy to say get distracted somebody who specialized in test or um division one might go and stray into sort of t20 or the st Lucia t10s uh, do you think basically that sort of the amount of cricket on offer has made it harder to win overall or um do you think it's the opposite way around no, I think it's um, I think it's been easier to win overall because um, there's only, as I said, there's only much so much time and resources um, bookmakers can put into pricing stuff up, uh, and there's just so much cricket now. Um, it never stops. Cricket mm. never stops. It's it's a it's a year round um, job as a as a cricket tipster. So the opportunities for betting and for betting well. Um, are fantastic mm. and and it's and it's and it's the same as it always was though if you do your research if you boil down and try to get as much done and really seek out that edge um then you'll you'll be okay and, and if you if you stick to your guns you don't have lazy opinions and um uh, you'll be all right i think um so you know it, it's never been better for cricket cricket punters and and that's mainly because of t20 because it's this, this franchise leagues which have proliferated around the world are you know offer some fantastic uh, value um and the the, the old uh, mantra of bookmakers pricing up franchises or or teams because of they've got the big superstar players uh, too short has been a very very profitable route taking on royal challengers bangalore and the indian premier league for example they've still never won it um, and and also understanding the value of um, bowlers in every format, um, it has been really important, uh, and it's still something which is not um, given um, the respect it, it, it should do. Bookmakers are still wowed by big bats, so you know there's a, there's a couple of strategies there or ways to think to to find help find your edges. I think that's a really interesting point upon which to end part two of Bending People with Ed Hawkins. Now, stick around tomorrow because we have a special surprise coming for you in part three, something we've not tried before. See you then. <laughs>